These are the wilds of the southern Philippines, wild in more ways than one. This is a lawless place where guns rule, powerful figures dominate and brutal arguments rage over who controls what and where. We've come to Mindanao to investigate the very worst of what happens here when renegade forces collide. This is one episode that we should really be ashamed of as a people. So it's not easy to allow this kind of uh, crime to just pass us by and no, no punishments. Despite its scale and toll, very little is known about what happened. We're about to find out a great deal more, including why this story has been left largely untold. I told him that you don't have to go there. <clears throat> it's very dangerous, especially the place. Uh, I told him, don't go there. It's uh, It was the 23rd of November last year, and a man named Toto Mangadadatu was doing the unthinkable in Mindanao, launching a challenge against the prevailing power. He declared he would register as a candidate for governor in the western province of Maguindanao. And here, this was a red-hot news story that excited a number of local journalists, including veteran Alejandro Bong Rablando. He is a very good man, lovable, good person, many friends. He has a lot of friends, not only here in our city, but everywhere. Bong Rablando joined a band of about 34 journalists on the new candidate's convoy to the provincial capital, where they were told candidacy papers would be filed. Only the candidate would not be along for the ride. It was too dangerous. He sent supporters, members of his clan, even his wife, to lodge the paperwork. He has uh, gone there many times. Not only once, twice, but many times. He knew those people very much. I'm very worried not for his job, but uh, for his life. The convoy would travel through the heartland of one of Mindanao's most powerful men, a warlord no less, a man named Andal Ampatawan. Clan supporters like these guys at any number of checkpoints in his territory call him Lolo. It was at just such a checkpoint that the November convoy was met by 100 heavily armed supporters of Lolo Ampatawan. What happened next defies imagination. What happened on this secluded hilltop was gruesome in the extreme. Witnesses say about 100 heavily armed men, including some police, stopped the convoy and then brought the people up here. They then opened fire. Women were shot in the groin. Others were killed as they tried to flee. Some of the bodies were then dumped in these pits. The killers weren't renegades or bandits. They were allies of this country's president. And some of the weapons they used in this massacre came from the government's own arsenal. When the dust cleared, everyone in the convoy was dead. 
cars with their occupants still inside had been crushed into the pits. Would-be candidate Toto Mangadadatu had lost a wife, sister and aunt. With more than 30 journalists dead, this would also be the worst mass killing of reporters the world has seen. I'm a military guy and I've seen so many dead people during an encounter, but this is not really... Uh, it's very hard to describe how, how awful uh, these things are. And then Difficult to believe something like that didn't happen in the Philippines, but it did. So it... it, uh, it well, uh, the bad thing is that it happened. The good thing is that it opened the eyes of all. Myrna Rablando lost her husband of 35 years, father to her seven children. I told him before, just stop being journalist, but he told me that he loves very much being a journalist. So I can stop him. I really missed him so much. Very, very much. I miss him every day of my life. Actually, I considered him as the man of my life. He, he, he has always been there for me. And he's always there to guide me. And I am very dependent on him before. Of course, many more families are grieving. Bong Rablando was just one of the journalists to die in a part of the world now considered more dangerous to cover than Iraq or Afghanistan. Those people cannot do nothing if our government uh, did not uh, give those um, money and um, power. Lolo Ampatuan's influence is all around, and yet he remains a mysterious figure. He prefers to stay out of the spotlight, but we've been told he will meet us. So he's happy for us too. That may have something to do with his current plight. He's been arrested, charged with ordering the massacre, and he's being held at a military hospital. Reporter, this is the governor. Nice to meet you. How are you? We find the 70-year-old clan leader surrounded by family and friends in a sunny corner of the hospital grounds, and he's happy to let them do the talking. Is he confident that um, he can defend the charges, the serious charges? Of course, of course. Of course. I'm afraid that 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 uh, definitely. Yeah. What does he think of the charges against him? Actually, it's only rumours, you know. There is no evidence. Yeah, there is no evidence to the uh, charges that they are filed in my, uh, to my grandfather. You know? Why would they do it? We don't know. We're told Lolo Ampatawan has assembled a legal army to fight the charges against him. That defence is taking shape back at the clan compound, and to get there we're told it's best to travel with armed support. Well, we're in the heart of Maguindanao province. This is the seat of power of the Ampatuans. And in fact, uh, we've been invited to the family palace, basically. This is where Ampatuan Senior, the godfather, lives, from where he controlled this entire province, basically. It's a breathtaking pile, and it reeks of big money. Salam alaikum. Mark Willisie from the ABC's Foreign Correspondent Program. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, Rex Jasper Lopez, lawyer for the Ampatuans. Nice With to meet the you, boss sir. and his entourage elsewhere, uh, Rex Jasper Lopez has plenty of room to work out how his team will defend their very powerful client. And it sounds like he's come up with a pretty simple plan. Denial. As far as the family, we, we, we don't have any knowledge on that matter. The government is accusing Mr. Ampatuan of masterminding the massacre. Yeah. Did he mastermind the massacre? As far, there, there are no evidences uh, linking the 
the family clear evidences, uh, so solid and clear evidences. There are no such as things that um, evidences that will pinpoint the responsibility of the family members. Lolo Ampatawan's strength and reach has been allowed to grow because of a very important friendship. This is Philippines President Gloria Arroyo, pictured with one of his sons. The President and the clan were so close, the Ampatawans were nicknamed her pet monsters. The government funded them and armed them as an extra fighting force on the ground in Mindanao. The payoff at the last election, the clan delivered Gloria Arroyo 99% of the votes in their fiefdom. This is the trouble when you have armed rebellion going on in a country. These things do happen. Now it's easy to say, yeah, it's wrong. But during the, the years past, I, I, would not, I would not know how to judge that. Well, different, different uh, officials, different uh, presidents, it was a relationship of practical and political convenience. Now, in the wake of the massacre, Defence Secretary Norberto Gonzalez is busily untangling the ties with the Ampatawans. Some of these people are supposed to be her friends and they're engaged in something like this. Can you imagine when you discover a friend doing something like that? So they're no longer friends? How can you, how can you keep such a relationship, you know? It's not just alarming, it's a shock to the nation, that, uh, that certain situations and arrangements have been allowed to deteriorate that far. You know, that's very shocking to us. For 30 years, this has been the overwhelming problem in Mindanao. The Moro Islamic Liberation Front has been fighting for an Islamic state in the south of this overwhelmingly Catholic country. The MILF has been accused of having ties with the terrorist group Jamaa Islamiyah and of sending its guerrillas to train with Al-Qaeda. They specialise in bomb attacks and ambushes and their separatist war has cost 150,000 lives. They've become such an intractable force here, government troops alone weren't enough. So privateers like the Ampatawans were drafted to help. Lieutenant General Raimundo Ferrer is the highest ranking commander here. He saw the clan's wealth and power grow exponentially. $300 million. $300 million. So the, the Ampatuans probably still have about $300 million hidden away somewhere. Yes, they have people. That's a lot of money. Yes. That's why they can pay a bat what they call battery of lawyers. They're not hiring one or two. Right? They're hiring 20 lawyers, 30 lawyers. Where did they get this money from? Government. Uh, this is the one newly issued to us. By yes, the, yes, yes. And a fortune flowing from the government and an arsenal of weapons direct from the General's army. The Ampatawans were deputies who became a force of their own. A long battery life now. Some of the people were taken as paramilitary forces, meaning the military gave them the arms, we gave them the bullets, we gave them uniform, and uh, we control them. And during operations, they go, they go with us. So it, it, it's a force uh, multiplier effect. And, and that's also, also uh, where the Ampatuans were very strong? Yes, they, are, they control this area. Now the general has been ordered to round up his former Ampatuan allies and to retrieve the enormous number of guns. It's very hard to encourage people to bring down their guns because, as I mentioned, there are some personal conflicts happening, so they would have to protect their own houses or their own communities. It's, it's, it's their right to protect them. So uh, we're talking of a million firearms loose. While the general chases the arsenal and the rogue Ampatawans, Dante Jimenez is Manila's big picture man in Mindanao. He's part of a government commission trying to crack the puzzling power structures of Mindanao and aiming to decommission the warlords. The commission was uh, created out of the uh, Maguindanao massacre and uh, the, the gravity is so enormous, enormous because of firearms found, not only firearms, 
ammunition and uh, vehicles that were uh, used that were uh, supposed to be used by the military or the police. What we could do is uh, perhaps uh, minimize, if not eliminate, the possibility of another uh, Maguindanao massacre to happen. Because there are already strong indications that there might be another uh, Maguindanao massacre in the offing in some of these provinces that we have been validated as very hot uh, areas. There are so many very hot areas in Mindanao, it's hard to imagine how any sense of order or what we know as normality could ever come to this place. We're heading to one of the areas of friction, where the Philippines Army is keeping a very close eye on the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. There's a fragile and uneasy peace agreement in place, but the army isn't taking any chances. What am I there? He's having a drink. And the militias are in that direction. This one, this one. I don't know where I'm at. Am I there? Sometimes, sometimes. Be good at it. Complicating matters for Lieutenant Ronilo Poe and his men are rogue and Patawans. Militias out here avoiding the authorities and adding another layer of danger. Police, police, police! Who's to know who opened fire on this patrol? So we're just crossing that little canal then, when there was a gun, a gunshot. It may have come to be coming from that village. So they're just going out the village to see what's going on. When the soldiers of Bravo Company reach the village, it's deserted. This is perfect terrain for an ambush, and the men remain on edge. It's precisely how so many Filipino soldiers have died. It will be some time before Lieutenant Poe gives the all clear. Organize, organize. The army unit will call this home for the next two months, ranging out and around the jungle here on daily patrols, trying to keep a lid on a very remote patch of a profoundly complicated, deeply divided place. Well, Bravo Company's basically taken over this village as its camp and we're camping in with them for the night. They're telling us that the Moro Islamic Liberation Front has a camp less than a kilometre in that direction. And not only that, but this area is a hotbed for Ampatawan supporters. And the army said there are at least a thousand armed Ampatawan supporters on the run still, hiding out in villages and scrub around this area. During our assignment here, we spent some time negotiating with a string of intermediaries and finally got into this MILF compound not far from where we were patrolling with the army. Our organisation is in fact MILF. Yes. We have Here we find leader Ghazali Jafar recalling his encounters with Lolo and Padawan. There were uh, several persons uh, killed uh, by cutting the body of the persons with the uh, chainsaw. And uh, many people here can witness to that. So he used a chainsaw to kill people? Yes, he used a uh, chainsaw to kill persons. But most of the time he used firearms to, to, to kill persons. Ghazali Jafar is not unhappy that the Ampatawan godfather is being disarmed. It's a few less enemy guns for him to worry about. I think he owned uh, not less than 5,000 firearms. So he basically controlled an army? He controlled an army. I think uh, he was able to, to do this because, uh, because of some favours, special favours, very special favours as a matter of fact, from uh, very important persons in the government. 
For the time being at least, the MILF doesn't seem to be taking advantage of the breakdown between the government and the Ampatawans. One shot, one kill. But just like the Philippines army, the separatists are keeping their weapons loaded while peace talks proceed. Are you ready to pick up the, the gun again if ah. these peace talks break down? We still have our guns. We did not surrender our guns. Still in our hands. So you're prepared? Yes, of course. All our guns, uh, Armalai, M14 and other high-powered guns, including massing guns, mortars, still with us. In this fractured, dysfunctional place, trust and goodwill are thin on the ground. So too is faith in the machinery of justice. That's the next test ahead. Already, investigators have concluded that as many as 20 police officers were involved in the November massacre. Witnesses and others working on the case are being intimidated, or worse. Some are even being killed. We, we know the consequence. You know, this is a very serious case for us. From his vantage point in Manila, the Defence Secretary concedes he may not be able to stop Lolo Ampatawan buying his way out of jail. I, I could not say that we can guarantee that that will not happen, you know. Given the uh, situation of, in the Philippines, these things do happen. I, ca I cannot deny that because there are those cases. Call me. And we're told hush money is on offer. Families of victims are being paid off. But the widow of one victim, at least, says she won't be taking any blood money. For me, money is nothing. When your husband is murdered, so you would not accept money if they offered you money. Yeah, I will not accept the money if they if they told me that I will stop the. Uh, seeking for justice? No way. We have to begin to look forward to a society where armed rebellion is no longer acceptable as a means of achieving uh, societal change or political change. We should really begin to condemn the use of violence. There is absolutely no justification no matter how noble the, the, the objective of a particular movement or, or, or group, employing violence is no longer acceptable.